Good morning. The scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 20, verses 27 to 40. Luke chapter 20, verse 27. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. Verse 34, And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die any more because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Verse 39, Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Thanks be to God for his word, and blessed are we who hear his word and obey. Good morning, church. It is said that human beings can live for 40 days without food, four days without water, and four minutes without oxygen. But we cannot live for four seconds without hope. Hope is a decision of the mind. It is like a seed planted deep in the bottom of our heart, and it brings forth flowers that bear fruit. Although the process is bitter, the fruit is sweet. By nature, we all are positive people. We, we all believe that and expect things to get better. We hope that the pandemic will be over soon. We expect our loved ones who, who are suffering from um, chronic illness to get well. We look forward to our prodigal son to return to God. We, we still believe that things will not get any worse than they already are. We human beings are hopeful creature. The moment you cease to hope, that moment you begin to die. But truth be told, we all have come to a point in our life when we began to lose hope sooner or later, if not now. In utter hopelessness, where do we find hope? Luke chapter 20, verses 27 to 40, shows us where. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, some Sadducees came to him and asked him a question. Now, there were several groups in Judaism during the time of Jesus, and the Sadducees were one of them. The other groups um, were like the Pharisees, uh, the Essenes, the Samaritans, uh, and some other groups. And they all have their own Bible with their own distinct belief. The Sadducees, the Sadducees were an elite type of aristocrats who received um, special privilege from the Roman government to control the temple and also to control the temple's worship, which brought them great wealth. They believe in God, but they only believe in the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, which they call the Torah, the Torah. They didn't believe in the resurrection because they, don't, they didn't see it in the scripture. Con accordingly, for them, there were no ultimate justice, no ultimate judgment. Death 
would be man's last sleep. For them, there is only death after life, period. They came to Jesus with a hypothetical question, with a hypothetical situation and story, uh, which I suppose they had already used that against uh, to challenge those who believed in the resurrection before. So they came to Jesus. It was about the law of elaborate marriage. Elaborate marriage is about brother-in-law's marriage, which is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. You see, in ancient Eastern societies, ancient Near Eastern societies, brothers lived together and they were responsible for the continuation of the family, li uh, family line. So the firstborn son, the firstborn son had the responsibility to look after uh, the family, um, the property, and everything when the father died. Since he the son became the extension of the father because women could not inherit the husband's property. So the son was extremely important to continue the family line. And also back then, people didn't believe in resurrection. So if there was no resurrection, the, the name of the man will have to be continued by someone else, by the elder son. In other words, back then, death would terminate life. But the elaborate marriage, the elaborate marriage was instituted to ensure that the name of the deceased would be preserved. So the law of Moses put a stop to the work of death. In other words, in other words, because of the law of Moses, the family line was able to continue even after the death of the husband. But let me ask you, how would you feel if you were one of the brothers and you saw your other brother begin to die one by one and soon it will be your turn to marry the widow? How would you feel? What would you react? If it were me, I would have quickly found someone else to marry and do it in the hurry. Now, this widow ended up marrying all six brothers of the husband. And they produced no children. And then, the woman herself died. So, here is the question for Jesus. Whose wife would she be so that a son might be raised up in the age to come during the resurrection. The question of the Sadducees was not about marriage, but about resurrection. Otherwise, two brothers in the story would have sufficient enough ground to make their point. But they mentioned seven brothers. For them, since there, there is no way any of the brother could, would qualify, could qualify as the husband of the woman, there is no way to justify the resurrection. So do you see the logic behind? Let me ask, if there is no resurrection, and if death is the final sleep, and if man's last breath is death, what is the purpose of living? If we live only to die, why do we even live in the first place? Since we, all, we are all alive right now, why do we have to die? If there is only death after life, let us eat and drink. For this is all that we have. Have you heard about um, a recent a movement called um, antinatalism? It argues that humans should not produce children because it is morally bad. 
last year, uh, last February, a 27-year-old Indian man wanted to sue his parents for bringing him to earth. He wanted to sue his parents. After 27 years, if I were the judge, I would have asked him to pay up all, for all those years his parents raised him. The movement believes that life is full of frustrations and irritations. You see, many lonely people remain single, while those who marry fight and divorce. People want to look younger, be younger, feel younger, but they age. Life is full of frustrations, irritations. And I believe perhaps at some points in your life, you would agree that life is pointless. Life is full of frustrations and irritations. Especially when you are hopeless, right? But when you are okay, you don't feel it that way. Why? When the Gospel of Luke was written, the early church was experiencing the cruelty of the Romans. They suffered a lot under the Romans' rule. They needed ultimate justice. They needed the ultimate judgment. They needed the hope of resurrection, the, the hope of the coming kingdom to carry them on through this difficult time. The early church was struggling with the hope, the meaning of the resurrection. In extreme pain, in extreme pain and unimaginable suffering, they knew that life must be more than that and not less. So let us see what Jesus has to say. Look at verse 34. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. For the Sadducees, there was only death after life. But for Jesus, there is life after death. Death is not the end. Death may be an interruption of life, but it is never a termination of life. Jesus tells us that there are two ages the present and the one to come. In this present age, there is sin, death, and new life. There is a life cycle, and in this life cycle, there will always be marriages and new lives brought into the world. But in the age to come, it is a different thing. In the age to come, there will be no sin, no death, and no marriage because it is no longer needed. There will be no marrying and no one will be forced into marriage like the one in Levirate marriage. All the people will be united, not as brothers, sisters, husband, wives, but as children of God. God loves His children so much that He provides everything he need, they need, including life with Him forever. The Father lives forever and therefore, being sons of the Father who live forever, His children will live forever. Jesus insists that we cannot die anymore. And I like this. We cannot die any, anymore in verse 36. What does He mean by that? We cannot die anymore. There is a difference between resurrection and immortality. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they became mortal, meaning they were capable of dying. Immortality refers to life that will not die. Resurrection refers to a life that though dies, God resurrects it and gives it a new form. When Jesus says that we cannot die. He is 
saying what resurrection will bring, what the sons and daughters of God will enjoy. Immortality. Of course, if you ask me what immortality is or um, how does a resurrection life look like, I can only say, I don't know. But one thing I do know, it will be way, way better than what we have right now. There will be no more tears. There will be no sin, no pain, no sickness, no hostility. There will be perfect peace, harmony, and tranquility. Faith, hope, and love will be realized. We are faced with a dilemma. What is that? You see, we cannot die. Yes, we cannot die, and yet we have to face death. Don't you think that is a dilemma? And we have to go through death to enter into another stage. Death is therefore very crucial. We have to pass through that to enter into another stage. Even though we cannot die, we must face it. Why? Because how you view death affects how you view life. A person who thinks a lot about death will have either one of these two responses. He's either afraid to die or looking forward to death. But for those who never thought of death, they most likely never thought of the meaning of life. Have you? I'm not asking you to die. I'm asking you to live as if you are preparing to die. And when you finally face death, you will die as if you are not dead. I read about um, an old pastor. Before he died, um, he ordered a big bowl of noodles. He consumed the whole bowl of noodles and gathered his children and his grandchildren around his deathbed. And he prayed for them, he blessed them. And then he lay down on his bed, closed his eyes, and into glory he entered. Wow, that was wonderful. This is what I say, to live as if you are to die. Die, but not dead. Yes, we all will die. But we are not children of death. Never. The end of our life is not death. Whether you die young or you die old, whether you die peacefully or tragically, death is not the end. But how you face death will determine if you are children of death or children of death resurrection. Now, equally important is how you live your life before you die. Jesus went on to say something very important. Look at verse 37. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Since the Sadducees had used Moses as their authority, Jesus quoted Moses to refute them. Now, the, the bush passage is found in Exodus chapter 3, where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush in Mount Horeb. Remember that? And when God appeared to Moses, and when God uh, said to Moses, He said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, uh, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am the God. Notice the verb used here. It is in the present tense, not past, even though all the patriarchs were already dead and their bodies had turned into ashes. The point here is this. Though they were dead, 
God was still their God as much as when they were alive. In the Hebrew concept, I like, uh, unlike the Greek way of thinking, body and soul are not separate from each other. Body and soul are to be seen as one, as a whole. That is to say, if God is still presently the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, then they are still alive and they are with God. The resurrection Jesus talked about is not about the cycle of the four seasons or the cycle of life and death or rebirth. No, he's talking about something more. He says God is not the God of anything dead. He is the God of the living and of life. Anything he touches will live. And it is not in the future. It is now. The love of the Lord will never allow his children to remain dead or one's reason to ever die again. Union with the Lord can only assure life. God is the Lord of the living. All people are meant to live, not die. When Luke recorded this statement, the Sadducee had probably already faded out. The statement was not for them, but for the early church and for us today. The hope of resurrection gave them and gives us a reason to go on living. There is life before death. But you might say, there is no life before death. We see wars, we see conflicts, we see injustice, we see pain, we see death. We see family in conflicts, we see relationships broken. Everywhere we turn, we see death, not life. If we cannot see life before death, how can we see death? How can we see life after death? If we cannot see resurrection now, how can we see resurrection in the future? If God is the God of the living, why are we seeing death? Why? There are two types of resurrection. Resurrection in this age and resurrection in the age to come. I call them resurrection one and resurrection two. This is similar to the already not yet concept we talked about a couple of months ago. In resurrection one, we see new life. We see a new creation. We are now in resurrection one. Uh, this is what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, that we are already raised with Christ and we are already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Resurrection 1 does not end war. It reveals the dignity of life. Resurrection 1 does not wipe away tears. It cries out with the victims of injustice and oppression. Resurrection 1 does not fix broken relationships. It seeks to sow peace, harmony, and unity. Resurrection 1 does not remove hatred, but shows love even to your enemies. Resurrection 1 does not eliminate your, our pains and our tears over the death of our loved ones. It gives us hope and strength to meet them in the age to come. Resurrection 1 is found in the midst of death, sorrow, and losses. It is never apart from them. Resurrection 1 is life as usual, but it leads us into resurrection Resurrection 1 
is a life that recognizes that death is real, but not the end. Jesus died, but not dead. In Resurrection 1, we may not touch and see Jesus, but we can feel it. He is alive in us and He is with us and others can see it. Resurrection 1 is not a doctrine to be proved or to be grasped. It is a life to be lived. It is the experience of divine presence. Because, because God is already with us now in life. He will be with us in death. He will give us life before death and He will give us life after death. He is with us in joy as well as in fear. He is with us in all things here, now, and forever. For He is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. We live to Him and for Him. In Him we live and move and have our being. Death leaves a vacuum in our hearts that no one can fill. But resurrection, resurrection one, gives us a hope that no one can steal. Because it is not a concept, it is not an idea or even not a mere doctrine. It is the power of Jesus manifested in our lives. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the matter of all matters, the question of all questions is, how then shall we live? How then shall we live? I read about a little boy by the name of Kenny who suffered leukemia and the disease progressed rapidly. Soon he was unable to go to school and then he was unable to go out and finally he was confined to his bed. One day, little Johnny, little Kenny asked his mother the question that her mother had most feared hearing. He said, Mommy, Mommy, what is it like to die? What is it like to die? The question was too heavy for the mommy. She went to the bathroom and she cried and she prayed. And then she came back. And then she told little Kenny, Kenny, do you remember how when you were very little, sometimes you would fall asleep in my bed? And how next morning when you woke up, you found that you were in your own bed and in your own room. How did that happen? Do you know? That happened because, Kenny, while you were sleeping, your father came and he lifted you up and carried you so gently to your own bed and to your own room. That, Kenny, is what death is like. Little Kenny smiled for he understood. A few weeks later, little Kenny fell asleep and while he slept, his father in heaven came and lifted him up and took him to his own bed and to his own room. Church, our father will carry us, will carry us through in this life. And when the time comes, He will bring us into another life. This is our hope. This is our joy. And this is our life before death. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you are the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You are God of the living 
and that in you alone do we find hope of resurrection in the age to come and meaning of life in this present age. Continue to speak to us and cause us to see that you are with us. Thank you because you never leave us nor forsake us and you will carry us through this life into the next. Help us, O oh Lord, to be faithful to you and to trust and walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. receive the benediction. May the God of Abraham be with you and cause you to rest in him. May the God of Isaac cover you with his grace and keep you from all harm. And may the God of Jacob grant you the hope of resurrection and life before death. May your life be filled with joy, contentment, and purpose as you grow in the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, and forevermore. Amen. seated after silent prayer and meditation, you may be dismissed.